Hello everyone, glad to have you on my channel. Today we're going to listen to the sixth installment of the memoirs of German Colonel Steidel Luitpold, regimental commander of Paulus's Sixth Army. Not only at the time when we prepared the formation of the German Officers' Union, but also after its formation not all members of the Union shared my openly expressed opinion that the tasks facing the National Committee could not be solved by means of newspaper articles, radio broadcasts, leaflets and discussions alone. It was necessary to influence the German soldiers directly at the front. Is it conceivable, they objected to me, to go to the Soviet front in the midst of hostilities and directly from there to establish communication with the soldiers on the German side, in such a situation, when the Germans and Russians are shooting at each other, to settle in the Soviet trenches? No, the motherland will not forgive us in any case. I spent nights thinking about this idea. We must oppose Hitler's total war with total resistance. Initially, it was difficult for my comrades to accept the conclusions I had reached. See, once when travelling to the General Camp Vojkovo, Colonel Novikov, noticing a small blue and white Bavarian medal for saving a life on my order block, said to me, Save people here too. Not just one, but many. Such a task could be carried out most effectively on the Soviet front itself, across the line of trenches, as during the deadly nights in Stalingrad. I will have to act together with communists, with people of atheistic outlook. Undoubtedly, I will also meet people who venerate icons and pray in silence, but whoever they are, and in the current situation with these people I am united by a common cause, the fight against fascism. I will also meet people who deeply hate and despise us, and they cannot treat us differently, because in front of them there are ashes and ruins, mounds of graves where their children, wives and mothers are buried. However, I believe that I will find friends among Russians, Georgians and Uzbeks, they will realize that although we are from the Nazi Wehrmacht, we are those Germans who have finally found their humanity and want to fight against fascism together with them. I will see the battlefields, but not as they were depicted by the artists of the First World War in a grim and harsh manner, but still trying to give even a picture of carnage a touch of heroism. I will see the battlefields as they became as a result of the actions of German soldiers. Before me will open a spectacle that testifies to the thirst for destruction, bloody rampage, villainous violence, when women and children were chased across the field, shooting them with machine guns. Such were roughly my thoughts. And in such a similar spirit I talked to various comrades, in an effort to induce them to participate in an enterprise which some called, to say the least, a dubious and risky venture. Up to that time only a few German officers had conducted their work while directly in Soviet military units. Soldiers, non-commissioned officers, Field officers were sent there. A few lieutenants went there. There was Dr. Pittenen. That was the end of the matter for the time being. But did not the camaraderie of the National Committee also oblige the senior officers to bear the same difficult responsibilities that the ordinary soldiers had undertaken? And the senior officers also had to work in the deepest depths. As the miners in the mines put it, in a workplace where it was stuffy and dirty, where one was constantly in danger, where there was a lot of dust and little light, in a workplace where one had to do hard, probably the hardest daily work. Meeting with Erich Wienert, we talked at length and in detail about his activities at Stalingrad. You will see for yourself, he replied. This activity develops differently every time, but there are people everywhere. You will be given all the help you need. When he once asked me where exactly, in my opinion, I could act most successfully, I did not hesitate to offer to send me to the place where now ten months after the complete defeat of my 767th Grenadier Regiment were units under the same number. The fact is that the general command of the land forces tried to disguise the demise of the 6th Army, staffing new military formations, gave regiments and other units the same numbers that were in the units destroyed in the cauldron. We also knew that in these military units gathered as many as possible of those officers and soldiers of the former 6th Army who did not participate in the battle in the encirclement. Thus, we could count on the fact that in the new formations will be friends and acquaintances. This circumstance was worthy of attention, given the nature of the work ahead. I remember well the meeting of the Presidium of the National Committee Free Germany, at which Eric Weinert made a proposal to send new commissioners to the front. All the members of the board of the German Officers' Union declared their readiness to go to the front. Not a week later, about the middle of December, it was finally decided that I should go to the second Ukrainian front together with Oberleutnant Reckel. When Erich Weinert bade us farewell and gave us our certificates in German and Russian, 
I met Major Epstein, who was to accompany me on the trip to the front. He and his family lived permanently in Moscow and spoke excellent German. By his civilian profession, he was a researcher in a major educational institution. He was unusually well-versed in German affairs. In addition, he had been to various Western countries before the war. We were to deploy our actions in the area south of Kremenchug, on the section of the front between Kirovograd and Terny. We managed to get a lot of experience in this area, which was very valuable later, when we acted in the Korsun Shevchenkovskoy cauldron, my closest collaborator, in addition to Oberleutnant Reckel, now finally became a major butchler, a member of the board of the Union of German Officers, with whom I was already familiar since the establishment of the Initiative Committee. Before the war, Butchler had worked in a large Rhenish industrial concern. This obviously explains why, after his release from captivity, I believe it was in the fall of 1948, he returned to West Germany. Riekel was a young sociable teacher from a small town near Wilshofen. It was also at that time that I spent a few days with Lieutenant Colonel Beckley, Major Engelbrecht and Lieutenant Dr. Abel. We reached the front line during a heavy snowstorm, walking many kilometres on paths, heading for outlying units. On Christmas Eve we spent the night in a house where an old woman and a girl of about four years old were staying. Here at first a very tense situation was created, as rumours went around the village that at nightfall there were Germans in one of the houses. So we were under police surveillance throughout the night, and for a few hours we were guarded even in the room itself. And the militiamen did not trust us doubted that our IDs and even the military documents of a Soviet major were really in order. Of course, in this newly liberated village, nothing was known about the National Committee Free Germany. In front of the front of the 376, Infantry Division 29.12, 1943. Krani at the go, Krasanaya Kamenka Front Headquarters, where we have been waiting for three days. A conversation with Lieutenant Colonel Zusmanovich. 31.12, 1943 preparation of leaflets, we make ourselves known. 1.1, 1 .1. 1944 received the records of the 376th Infantry Division. 7.1, 1 .1. 1944 I talked to German prisoners of war for the first time. About 40 people. The impression is terrific, in the evening talk again about the National Committee and the Officers' Union. 12.1. 1944 order on 106th Infantry Division and on 282nd Infantry Division. Punishment, so many sticks, the Middle Ages. 22.1. 1. 1944, I spoke four times on a powerful station, each time for five minutes distinctly repeated, review by FDD. Such sampled extracts from my diary could be cited innumerable. But where to begin, if every day there were new events and sometimes of decisive importance? At the end of December, we arrived in the area north of Kirovo, Grad and Terny. We crossed the Dnieper by a pontoon bridge. In the middle of the river, the ice had already moved. Huge ice flows were rushing downstream. The overflowing water broke the ice edge near the shore and partially flooded the ice blocks. Everywhere day and night life was boiling. The first restoration work was unfolding without interference from the German side. This was not to be expected since the powerful Soviet offensive west of Kiev had captured the attention of Hitler's Wehrmacht, especially the aviation. Major Epstein did everything in his power to get us as quickly as possible to the headquarters at our destination. There we were received by Lieutenant Colonel Zusmanovich, who thoroughly explained to us the situation at the front, of fighting on this section of the front just suspended. During the following days, German units tried to strong artillery fire and counterattacks to prevent the Soviet troops from crossing the river. Soon new operations were to begin. In the headquarters of Lieutenant Colonel Zusmanovich, I met Major Rubin. He initially kept a dry tone, not going beyond purely business-like contact. It was only after a few weeks that personal relations began to be established. One could sense that his hatred of fascism and indignation at everything that touched the Nazis had turned into ill will toward all Germans. As he later told me once, it was only after severe mental distress that he was able to bring himself to operate with the National Committee. In the past, Germany had occupied a large part of his life. As a teacher of German literature by profession, he had thoroughly studied, even delved deeply into the lives and writings of the great German humanists. When Germany, having violated the treaty, attacked the Soviet Union, when the Wehrmacht and the SS rampaged on his native land, 
and it became known about the inhuman treatment of civilians and prisoners of war, about the mass destruction of people, about the senseless destruction of towns and villages. Germany became for him a symbol of betrayal and barbarism. It was not only that Germany had betrayed its treaty partner, but that Germany, the country of Goethe, Schiller, Hein, Marx and Engels, had betrayed everything we cherished and valued in it. It had betrayed its humanist traditions, desecrated its great culture, the achievements of its scientists, he told me excitedly when we got to know each other better. But in the first days of our acquaintance with Major Rubin, the three of us, Butchler, Reckel and I, left alone, more than once lamented his peculiar restraint. This depressed and bound us, we did not know how to behave. Major Epstein was a good judge of character. For several days he observed the relationship between us and Major Rubin, and then he took me aside and explained something to me in private. I was shocked, apart from his wife, children and mother. They had been evacuated in advance to Tashkent. Major Rubin had lost all his relatives, and not during the war as a result of bombing or artillery fire. No later. They had been killed, they had fallen victim to mass shootings in Kiev. Epstein's relatives, too, underwent terrible ordeals at the hands of the Nazis. He, too, told me how difficult it was for him, in spite of everything, to keep his faith in the existence of another Germany. A Germany of high humanistic culture, a Germany whose best representatives had fought against fascism in Spain in the past, and now were fighting against Hitler in the same way, both in their homeland and here in the National Committee. So what if we expressed good and correct thoughts at meetings and in leaflets, and that we ourselves felt more at ease, because we were in the ranks of the anti-fascists, together with the Soviet people? All this was not enough. We had to be always clearly aware of how much the Soviet people, to whom we wanted to extend our hand, had suffered. We had to always remember how difficult it is for a Soviet soldier to reconcile himself with the fact that next to him stand, apart from communists and emigrants, and German officers and soldiers, people who were among those who attacked and devastated his homeland. Reckel probably reacted more naturally and simply to this difficult situation. The Soviet comrades had the easiest time coming into contact with him. They probably liked the fact that he was always on the spot, ready to get his hands on everything. He soon learned to explain himself in Russian. If he came across a schoolroom that was in a little bit of good condition, or found a bookcase, he would linger there and try to find out if there were any similarities between the German and Soviet teaching systems. Are the textbooks from a methodological point of view built differently from ours? Couldn't we get a timetable of lessons somewhere? Of course, we were not free to be inquisitive. We had to establish contact with the German side as soon as possible. That was our task and there it was solved. We had to make a daily appraisal of the piles of letters coming in from captured mailbags, and sometimes from wallets. We had to make sense of the fresh newspapers arriving from our homeland, from Munich, Hamburg or Ingolstadt, sometimes only a week old. Each of us tried in this way to learn more about the situation of the opposing German group. We had to have as much information about it as possible in order to find words that would inspire confidence. Hearing this material made a terrific impression. Air raids on Germany, anxieties and worries, desperate homesickness, but also requests for food, fur coats, boots, and we knew how such things are obtained. Their demagogic appeals to promote the soldiers' good fortune in the battles against the Russians. Falsified reports in the newspapers, lies, slogans imbued with hatred. At two o'clock in the morning, we turned on the radio. It was exactly 24 hours in the homeland. The break from yesterday to tomorrow, we began transmitting information. We are Sir Mark reports, the feisty chatter of the notorious commentator, who at the final stage at the Volga glorified us, and a few months later informed us that we had lost our heads and were committing one act of high treason after another. And of course, at the point of a Russian revolver, we're reading statements dictated to us on the Moscow radio. Then we switched to the reception of other stations. We made sure that we listened to all significant broadcasts in German, apart from the Moscow radio broadcasts in German. We listened mainly to the news broadcast by the Swiss radio stations and the BBC from London. The Soviet section of the front we were on was facing the new 376th Infantry Division and the new 767th Grenadier Regiment. Are there people I know there on the other side? What would their reaction be when they got leaflets with our pictures in their hands? Officers and soldiers of the newly manned 376th Division? From the first German prisoners of war, I learned that my eldest son, a young lieutenant, 
was on the section of the front located in front of us. A few days later I learned from a captured field officer what had happened to my son. As soon as our activities in the National Committee became known, he was taken to Army headquarters and interrogated there. However, all attempts to make him renounce his father failed. The general command was cautious. When it became impossible to silence our activities in the National Committee, when our leaflets, photos and comments on the radio could no longer be declared gross falsity, the Nazis resorted to the means they always used when trying to eliminate their political enemies. Our families were under house arrest, and we were sentenced to death in absentia in the summer of 1944. And the pincers at Korsan closed. After the liberation of Kirovograd, the first and second Ukrainian fronts began a new operation, as a result of which the 8th German Army was again in a critical situation. The Soviet formations that had taken the offensive, namely the 5th Guards Tank Army under General Rotmistrov and the 6th Tank Army under General Kravchenko, broke through the front in late January, moving from the northeast and northwest, and met near Zenigorodka deep in the rear of the 8th Army. There was a new cauldron, in which in a relatively small space were squeezed and surrounded by two German army corps, XXII Corps of the 1st Panzer Army and Ixe Corps of the 8th Army. Given the lesson learned on the Volga, the German command tried to immediately take countermeasures. First of all, it was necessary to organize supply by air, just as at Stalingrad. The commander of Army Group South, Field Marshal Manstein, had to allocate powerful forces to break through the cauldron. It was a matter of seven and then nine panzer divisions which were ordered to attack the Soviet formations. German troops were not in due time, brought to the starting lines, and the coordination of their actions was unsatisfactory. Again they began to boast falsely, and with misplaced optimism of the first successes, which were quickly nullified by the actions of the Red Army, the fighting strength and moral superiority of which the German command again underestimated. We expressed our intention to move into the new cauldron at Korsun Shevchenkovsko, and Colonel Zusmanovich had once approved our plan, promising to give us all the assistance necessary to enable us to influence the German units. We arrived at our new base of operations on February 2, just on the anniversary of the day when the hellish agony at Stalingrad came to an end. Was it really all going to happen again? Then 200,000 German soldiers and officers had needlessly died. Now the same fate threatened 70 or 80,000 Germans. While still at our former base, I appealed to the encircled troops with the following message. The collapse of Hitler's war machine is only a matter of time. In order to save Germany, to save everything that can still be saved, it is necessary to stop the war immediately. All round march to the homeland. So ended my first leaflet of January 23, intended for the troops trapped in the cauldron near Korsun Shevchenkovsky. Already on the way to the southeastern edge of the cauldron, and during the first discussion of the situation, it became clear to me that this slogan had become unrealistic. Here, the saving way out was not to march back to the homeland, but to stop the struggle, which had become senseless, to capitulate, to come over to our side, to the side of the National Committee Free Germany. Therefore, my second leaflet demanded that we lay down our arms and join the National Committee. We had already discussed such an option, at the fourth plenary meeting of the National Committee of September 24, 1943, in Lu At about the same time in Lunu, I proposed to Erich Weinert and General von Sidlitz in Lunu to support our actions by issuing National Committee leaflets here and mainly by sending letters from our generals to the commanders of the formations caught in the encirclement. This was done. Immediately after our arrival at the new operating base, we received letters from Generals Dr. Corfes and Latman addressed to the commanders of the XEI and XI Army Corps who knew them. A few days later I learned that another group of the German Officers' Union was to arrive. It consisted, besides General von Seidlitz of Major General Dr. Corfes, Major Leverens, Friedemann, representatives of the Russian command also arrived. Major General Shikin, Lieutenant General Babich, Major General Petrov, Colonel Braginsky and Wolf Stern. In addition, Burpt von Kugelgen. Lieutenant Colonel Bickley and Erwin Engelbrecht were also active in the cauldron at Korsun Shevchenkovsky. Although our group could not make personal contact with the other brigades of the National Committee, it was still possible to coordinate our actions well. By radio communication we exchanged our experiences, coordinated our arguments, and sent to their destinations leaflets and letters addressed to unit commanders by General Seidlitz, Major General Dr. Kurfs, and Lieutenant General von Daniels. We left for the boiler area in bitter cold, 
but on February 2 the weather changed, a warm wind blew, at times we were whipped by rain, at times snow with icy hail. During the day the vehicles stuck in the mud, at night froze to the ground. All this made our actions much more difficult. Nevertheless, we managed to scout the situation at the front line on February 3 and talk to the German soldiers who had just surrendered. We needed our impressions and the latest information to make our propaganda campaign. Leaflets, letters and radio broadcasts as operative as possible. Here at Korsen we wanted to use the experience we had already gained at Kerovogrek. We strove in our leaflets and radio broadcasts to reproduce as accurately as possible the situation in each military unit and, if possible, to address the commanders and soldiers directly. As the German soldiers later confirmed in their testimony, we did the right thing by immediately radioing the names of people who had just been captured. This was a particularly successful and thought-provoking technique. Soon we had to stop transmitting through horns, trench loudspeakers and radios because the weather interfered. The greater importance was given to conversations with German defectors and prisoners who, at a time when the encirclement front had not yet stabilised, were looking for ways to escape. In any case, it was clear from the very beginning. The insolent soldiers who urged to hold out to the end and tried to maintain morale by means of cruel orders were opposed by other soldiers and officers who followed the development of events with deep disappointment and dist Apparently, the memories of Stalingrad revived not only in our memory, but also in the memory of those who were now also caught in the encirclement. In my letter to Lieutenant General Cruz, commander of the 389th Infantry Division, I implored him to remember the senseless death of the Germans on the Volga, appealed to his mind, to his sense of responsibility, and urged him to save his division from senseless destruction. This letter was handed to General Cruz by a POW PFSE. Jacob, who also distributed it as a leaflet to the soldiers of the 389th Infantry Division. Jacob performed his task brilliantly. At the station to which he returned, a special password, Password Jacob, even emerged, which served as a pass to switch to the side of the National Committee. In an effort to open up new perspectives also for those soldiers and officers who had been members of the OSS, but who were not inwardly connected with the executioner regime, we addressed them with a special leaflet, and not without success. I reported the first encouraging results of our work to the National Committee in Liu Nu on February 9. A decisive role in all this was played by our German and Soviet comrades, who printed our leaflets in headquarters just behind the front line and handed them to us a few hours later. Only those who had seen such a printing press could appreciate such an achievement on its own merits. Directly behind the front line, it meant that the work was carried out under the most primitive conditions. We had to change location frequently and quickly, and this meant not least that the work was carried out under enemy fire. After the Red Army's offer of surrender, transmitted on February 8, remained unanswered, we intensified our efforts to obtain soldiers who were making the return crossing. These were prisoners of war who were willing to cross the front line and report the contents of the special conditions of surrender, namely, a guarantee of life and personal safety, medical care for the wounded and sick, as well as return home at the end of the war, satisfactory food, lodging and clothing, and, to the extent possible, improvements in the conditions of existence, the senseless deaths of tens of thousands. Meanwhile, the attempts of Hitler's command to unblock the encircled group failed. Only near Lysianka, the shock group managed to wedge into the cauldron for 10-12 kilometers. But then the wedge was cut off, and the German units had to regroup near Shenderovka, then bled the 1st Panzer Division in the struggle for height 239. This height dominated the passage into the cauldron, and the blocking group of troops it failed to capture. Nevertheless, the generals responsible for the operation, especially SS General Hill and Lieutenant General Lieb, decided to strengthen the resistance and prepare to break through the ring on the night of February 1617. They were blocked by Soviet powerful tank and artillery formations. Thus, the German generals repeated a mad enterprise reminiscent of the breakout options discussed in the final days of the Stalingrad Cauldron. Such a horrifying catastrophe unfolded, which had an overwhelming effect even on us who had lived through the terrible collapse of the Sixth Army. Undoubtedly, whoever managed to escape from the cauldron was guided by only one rule. Save whoever you can, no matter what way. The few motorized units moved westward over the bodies of dying soldiers, under the annihilating barrage of Soviet artillery, to meet the equally annihilating fire of the barrier located at height 239, 
and along the village of Hainoi Tikic. Panic reigned in the German grouping. The soldiers, gripped by despair, abandoned vehicles, guns, even their rifles, and tried in small groups or alone to find a way to escape. Only two to three thousand men succeeded few headquarters, including SS Gruppenführer Heel and Lieutenant General Lieb. On the battlefield remained the vast majority of those soldiers and officers, who February 16 at 23 hours moved on the march, trying to break through the encirclement. Kept alive only those 18,000 soldiers and officers who before February 16 refused to fight. Many of them, some of them even from the first days of fighting in the cauldron, kept our leaflets with them, hiding them either in their windings or under the collar of their cloak or in their pant leg. Most often we found them carrying the leaflet your salvation, which was dropped on my instructions on February 7. It was a small format, and it was easy to hide. We talked with the German soldiers and for the first time organized large rallies. At Smeller we gathered about 1,200 prisoners of war. From the conversations we found that more soldiers and officers knew about the National Committee than we had realized. 59% of the POWs I interviewed confirmed that they were aware of the existence of the National Committee even before their captivity. However, they were not aware of the goals and objectives of the National Committee. Therefore, after the battles of Korsun Shevchenkovsky, we, in addition to local leaflets concerning the situation on a certain section of the Soviet-German front, began to drop leaflets with the manifesto and later with the text of the 25 conditions for the end of the war. At the very time when we stood before the endless stacks of corpses on this battlefield, when the helpless wounded left on the field, if not picked up by Soviet orderlies, were dying, abandoned by their comrades, Generals Hill and Lieb were lying, passing off the deaths of their divisions as a breakthrough victory. They were awarded the highest Nazi orders. However, General Steemerman fell in battle with the enemy, was not posthumously awarded, and the circumstances of his death have not yet been clarified definitively. Some of his radiograms allow us to conclude that he skeptically assessed the activities of the high command, so in a radiogram sent in the evening of February 16, said, Steemerman's group can break through the enemy's front on its own section, but will not be able to force a second breakthrough through the enemy positions in the location of the II tank corps. In other words, Stemmerman sought clarity, asking what awaited him at Lysianka. New battles with superior Soviet forces or a meeting with deblocking German units. He was never given a definite answer. He received a categorical order from Manstein. Password freedom, target Lysianka, 23 hours. The information obtained during the interview with the prisoners allows us to reasonably suggest that at the final stage of fighting, when attempting to break through, Gen. Stemmerman was no longer in command of operations. S. Gruppenführer Hill suspected that the general intended to surrender, arrested him and ordered him to be shot. The tragedy at Baby Year. In mid-March, the first period of my activity at the front ended, and I returned to Moscow via Kiev. In the Ukrainian capital, I lived in Major Rubin's apartment as his guest. His mother took care of us. Kiev still lay in ruins, but the will to live of its courageous inhabitants was unshaken. With unimaginable energy, they rebuilt factory shops, schools and dwellings and resumed industrial production. Here in Kiev, I first learned the details of Baby Yar, the horrific systematic mass extermination of people, 195,000 citizens of Kiev. Men and women, children and the elderly, fell victim to the rampage of the fascists. Almost all of them in the terrible ravines of Babi Yar were shot, thrown into pits, strangled, burned. It is simply impossible to imagine, to realize all that happened in Babi Yar. The spectacle of hell, created by the imagination of Hiram Osh, pales in comparison with the picture of Nazi atrocities. What I heard there from the relatives of the innocent victims of the Nazi extermination machine confirmed the justice of every word in the manifesto of our national committee, which demanded that there should be a just, merciless trial of the war criminals, their instigators, their patrons and accomplices, of those who defiled, dishonored Germany. However, only a few of the criminals responsible for the Baby Year massacre, including Erich Koch, Rich Commissar of Ukraine, were brought to trial. The others have not been punished for their guilt to this day. Ten months on the first Ukrainian front. After the first results of our activities had been discussed and analyzed in Lunev and the frontline commissioners had exchanged experiences, I left again on April 14 for the fighting units. This time for the first Ukrainian front, 
There, I remained until February 1945. I worked closely with Lieutenant Colonel Dubrovitsky, Major Shuchukin, Senior Lieutenant Spitzen, Senior Lieutenant Newdorf, and together with my comrades Ruth Stoles and Hans Gossens. On the same battlefield, the frontline proxies of the National Committee were Major Erwin Engelbrecht, Sergeant Rudy Scholes, Lieutenant Dr. Abel, and Lieutenant Heinz Schmidt. The first Ukrainian front was tasked with liberating Western Ukraine, and with the beginning of the summer offensive, making its way to the Vistula. In mid-January 1945, the front's formations went on the offensive from the bridgehead near Sandomir in the direction of Krakow. Ten days later reached the Oder, surrounded Breslavo, crossed the barrier strip along the Oder, Beaver and Nias, and advanced to the Elbe. The fourth tank army of the first Ukrainian front formed a shock wedge, and it was its units reached Torgo, where a significant meeting with the American army took place. We were on our way to the headquarters in Zabarash. On the way on the escape routes of the Nazi armies before us opened an impressive sight, clearly testifying to the scope of the just completed operation, which was defeated the eastern flank of army groups and reached the border of Romania along the Prut River. German losses in equipment were so great that the Soviet units simply registered the destroyed and captured tanks, marking the next number on the turret with oil paint. Just now, it was number 426. An hour later it was 980, and just before Zerbaraj, 1120. However, the assumptions that the outcome of these battles would lead to the final catastrophe of the Nazi Wehrmacht were not justified. From the testimony of the wounded and prisoners, as well as from other sources of information available to us, we learned that the fascist military command took desperate measures to suspend the Red Army offensive in the area of Torchin, Bieristekko, Shertkov, Kuti. These attempts were combined with scorched earth tactics. Whole herds of cattle were senselessly shot, sheep were machine gunned, sugar factories, silos and whole villages were set on fire. Everything in the way was indiscriminately shot, blown up, distressed. The dwellings where old people and women with children had taken shelter were not spared either. In Zabarash remained in relative order only because it was possible to occupy this point quickly, and the retreating units did not have time to blow it up. The inhabitants finally breathed a sigh of relief, came out to meet the liberators and hugged them joyfully. They greeted us too, as we were in ordinary Soviet uniforms without insignia. It is understandable that the inhabitants were astonished when we were unable to answer them in their own language. It is also understandable the distrust with which people treated us, until one of our Soviet friends explained to them what our mission was. These people, who had suffered so much, were naturally extremely wary of meeting a man who spoke only the language of the villains who had desecrated the sacred Soviet land. Once near Zabaraj, we, wishing to orient ourselves on the terrain, walked quickly through the village, heading for the cars that were waiting for us a few kilometers away. At the exit of the village, the villagers met us with the greatest indignation and curses. They saw in us the very Nazi soldiers who, only a few days before their mother's eyes, had drowned sixteen children between the ages of two and twelve in a well. For such a crime there was to be immediate retribution. Our friend Major Epstein and the escort from headquarters had to make great efforts to explain to the justly indignant people that there were Germans who had long ago dissociated themselves from Nazi crimes and were fighting shoulder to shoulder with them, with Soviet soldiers and Soviet citizens, against the Nazi barbarians. Rallies. When we were first invited to a rally in 1943, we were puzzled at first. The word rally was unfamiliar to us. It was associated in our minds with something typical of England, of English conditions. Later we got used to this terminology and began to convene meetings ourselves as frontline plenipotentiaries. This form of meeting proved useful and took root in our practice. The meeting of prisoners of war convened as soon as possible after they were captured had its positive aspects. People seized with apathy, despair, consciousness of hopelessness. Fear could be indoctrinated with new thoughts which helped them to cope with depression. Such rallies could not be held in the same pattern. The circumstances under which soldiers were captured were far from uniform. Some voluntarily laying down their arms, others captured in panic flight. They stood before us in a motley crowd, men of different backgrounds, professions from different units, with different military ranks. Almost invariably, however, soldiers and officers were separated from each other. Often, as a result of vigorous and swiftly conducted combat operations, soldiers from the rear units and Nazi organizations were captured, as well as members of the Imperial Labor Organization and TOTS construction units, soldiers from the economic units. 
and the chained dogs of the field gendarmerie, officers of the National Socialist Leadership and the Imperial Monopoly Administration, intendants and railway workers. Our first brief speeches were received with the greatest restraint. We had the impression that we were addressing an amorphous mass of people whose appearance and behaviour were more or less impersonal. There was no indication that we were addressing people from a wide variety of professions. It was felt that all those present, almost without exception, were distrustful of what was being said to them. It was reminiscent of our own reactions in the POW camp. It was necessary to break the ice of indifference, and this was easier to do while the impressions directly connected with Hitler's military adventure were still fresh. We therefore considered it very essential to organise rallies immediately, acting in solidarity with the officers, political workers of the Red Army, the frontline confidence and their assistance from the National Committee. Great was the surprise of the prisoners of war when officers addressed the soldiers or soldiers addressed the officers and each discussed problems that either had not arisen before or had not been clearly formulated and in any case had not been thought through to the end. To the last conclusions. Of course, the prisoners had already exchanged opinions, had already expressed to each other views which were in sharp contradiction to those judgments which it was customary to express openly. However, they believed that it was necessary to be cautious and only in the narrowest circle to express their critical thoughts and doubts, their negative attitude to fascism and their refusal to support Hitlerism. What a thrilling impression, therefore, was produced by a sudden exclamation in the crowd when one of the prisoners finally gave vent to his boiling feelings. It was the first tremendous expression of the pangs of conscience that had tormented the man for years. This person unconsciously became a spokesman for the sentiments of the soldier masses. And then the soldiers themselves in turn became openly indignant and outraged. Often such spontaneous outcries and speeches stimulated, and more than we were able to do ourselves, the determination of the prisoners to follow the calls of the National Committee. We wrote down the addresses of the captives' families, which were then included in a Moscow radio broadcast. We gave everyone who wished to do so the opportunity to send home the greetings written on the leaflet, or to address their comrades by loudspeaker or radio. It is difficult even to estimate properly the strength of the effect on the mood of the prisoners and their families in Germany that the Moscow radio had on their greetings. After all, a slanderous campaign was waged day after day in Germany. False rumours were spread as if captivity meant Siberia or death. In any case, nothing would ever be heard of this man. And now the home address of a prisoner of war was recorded, and the home country could learn that he was alive. Indeed, our broadcasts were listened to attentively in Germany, and there were many such courageous people who dared to inform their families that their husband or father had made himself known on the Moscow radio. This happened to me as well. In her first letter of January 1946, my sister wrote to me, However, despite everything, there are many decent people, and they already on February 2, 1943 in the evening informed us by telephone. Your brother is alive. The next day, February 3, at half past seven in the morning, I was returning from church, and a figure blocked my way. My husband asked me to tell you that today at three o'clock Moscow reporter, Mr. Steidl is alive. Then the milkmaid repeated the same thing. Even in the shop a voice was heard. I have something to tell you, Colonel Stadel is alive. During my activity on the first Ukrainian front, one of my tasks was to lecture to the cadets of the front school. It was established in March 1944 in Zhitomir, from there transferred to Zbaraj, then to Rudnik na Sanja, in February 1945 to Krakow, then to Breslavl, and finally transferred to Radibiel. What meaningful conclusions which gave me strength and vigour I came to when I compared the trainees in the courses with the participants of the first POW rallies. We received a new impetus in our work, even when we noticed at a rally that truthful words had weakened the despair of the listeners, caused glimmers of confidence, and encouraged them to think for themselves. But here in Rudnik, we met like-minded young soldiers and officers who were willing to work as assistant front commissioners of the National Committee, who were ready to sneak across the front line to deliver letters to German generals, to distribute leaflets in the fascist rear, we told them about our months-long work, gave them advice on how to make an effective leaflet, and always under the impression of meeting with the cadets, looking at those open young faces. I thought, these are the same people. They were present at the first meetings when they had just been captured, and they are here in front of me in the front school. What was said then to the desperate people with tired, distrustful, fierce faces, 
All this was not wasted and has borne fruit here at the school. Self-work. What only did not enter into the sphere of activity of the front commissioner. Agitation speeches on the Soviet front line of fire, composing leaflets, working with the megaphone, with the Ogu. Trench speaking installation and through the MSUEU. Powerful speaking installation, explanatory conversations with individuals, rallies and reports at the front school. Coordination of work with Soviet propaganda organs and analysis of our activities for a report to the Presidium in Lunev. I had to write articles for the newspaper phrase Deutschland and prepare commentaries for the Moscow radio. Thirteen that period I wrote 160 leaflets and over 40 radio texts. I had to constantly work on myself to successfully accomplish all these tasks. I had to carefully analyse the course of affairs at the front, carefully study letters, newspapers and magazines from captured German mailbags in order to make correct and convincing arguments on this basis. I had not to forget how difficult was my own path to a correct understanding of reality. And bearing this in mind, I had to try to patiently enter into the moods of the soldier or officer standing before me. Besides, it was necessary to study political problems intensively. For it was not simply out of a sense of protest, out of opposition to the manifestations of the fascist system, that we had embarked on our path, the path of the National Committee, and followed that path. We had to understand the preconditions of fascism, to consider the question of how to eradicate fascism definitively and what should replace it, so that our fatherland might again take its rightful place in the family of nations. It was necessary to familiarize oneself with life in the Soviet Union, to understand the significance of the October Revolution of 1917, about which among the German bourgeoisie only perverted and wrong ideas were spread. It was necessary to study the science that formed the foundation of the October Revolution and the basis of the Soviet stack. Marxism-Leninism I did not attend any anti-fascist schools or courses in the Soviet Union, but developed for myself my own program, on the basis of which I expected to perceive and learn as much as possible, to accumulate independently acquired and thought-out knowledge about the life of the socialist state, which would be of great value to me in the future. Along with literature, especially historical works and fiction, I used movies as a means of self-education. During those years I watched no less than 140 movies. True, I did not have enough knowledge of the language to grasp the subtleties of the dialogue, but nevertheless, these films gave me an unusually rich material for understanding the essence and character of the Russian man, his desire for education and receptivity to art. It was instructive for me to get acquainted with the life of different generations, the depiction of people in everyday life in the family circle and their attitude towards young people. All these pictures seemed to me extremely close to life and authentic. No embellishment of everyday life, no external gloss, no stamps, and in depicting personal conflicts, no artificially constructed characters, in all unobtrusive pedagogy, subtle knowledge of the human soul, exciting scenes, exciting denunciation of shortcomings, remnants of the past. Thus I gradually comprehended the path travelled by Russian people over the centuries, the tumultuous process of development until the time when the great October Socialist Revolution awakened the conscience of mankind. I relived the events of the First World War, assessing them from a new perspective. I comprehended their significance and compared my new understanding with my own experience. The inner connection of historical events was revealed to me. I learned to critically evaluate the history of my people. I was struck by the attitude of Soviet people to culture. Somewhere in Sanaa we were invited to a concert of a Soviet ensemble. We sat in the open air at the edge of a forest or on a hillside so that we could look out over the surrounding countryside. From the very beginning and during the performance the crowd was swarming. There were officers and soldiers, medical personnel, all mixed up, some obviously from the field kitchen and some after repairing the gun carriage. But first we were confused by the fact that the ensemble was small. Only three people, but these three people, three amateurs showed as performers truly artistic skill. However, it was not only the performers who amazed me, but for two or three hours they were present at the concert of this small troupe. In the Wehrmacht they would have considered the organisation of such a performance an inappropriate pretension. And when else has it ever happened that the audience listened to the reading of passages from classical works for almost an hour, and with such attention, fascination and deep understanding? Truly you could say, 
Give these artists a square meter of space and no one from the audience will say that he was disappointed with the performance. Educators in military uniforms. It may seem strange that in naming the sources from which I learned the character of the Soviet people and their world, I did not speak first of all of meetings with the people themselves, but spoke of literature and cinema, hence of forms of reflection of reality, not of its direct perception. Of course, also at the front, quite as much as in Sudsdal or Krasnogorsk, conversations with Soviet people were of decisive importance. At first, however, my poor knowledge of the Russian language deprived me of the possibility of carrying on a conversation that was not only about the factual side of things. In addition, everyday life during the war is different from peacetime, and life during the revolutionary years is different from the times of uninterrupted economic construction. Thanks to the movies, I got a glimpse of ordinary everyday life under a variety of conditions. At the same time, I became acquainted with the 30-year history of the world's first socialist state. And finally, because movies and literature depict reality perceived emotionally. And this meant that thanks to the peculiar manner of the greatest masters of Soviet cinema, the viewer was strongly and excitingly influenced. We had many meetings with Soviet people, with officers and soldiers, with our landlords. More often than not, they were collective farmers or even a track guard on the railroad. Women took care of us as touchingly as Soviet soldiers. However, it was only natural that we had the best contact with the liaison officers in the Soviet headquarters. It goes without saying that in our conversations the attention was concentrated, first of all on our general tasks, on agitation work at the front. But since all work addressed to the people has a diverse character, we could not limit ourselves to analysing events at the front, to evaluating the testimony of prisoners of war, but had to discuss many other things as well. The life of Soviet society, the path Germany had taken, and the path it should take in the future, the psychology of the Germans. Of course, one did not exclude the other. We needed military and political information, for otherwise we would have reduced our agitation to general phrases, and then the work would have been wasted. The more accurately we were informed of the situation in the opposing German units, the more purposefully we covered the situation in the leaflet, the stronger and more lasting was its effect. The best example is our talking maps, a simple chart on which was drawn the front line as it became as a result of the last Soviet offensive. I myself held the first such map in my hands in the cauldron at Stalingrad. Sometimes, when exchanging information, we delved into highly specialised professional topics. I well remember a meeting with a very high-ranking Soviet officer, a meeting arranged by Colonel Dubrovitsky. The conversation was about the final stage of the struggle, and the high-ranking officer offered me to draw schematically, as I imagine it, the development of Allied operations up to their meeting on German territory. I took out of the captured German geographical atlas map, drew in the form of a rough scheme strategically most favourable for each side of the paths of advance of troops, and concluded that the first meeting should occur on the LB, namely in the area of the Rees. I had indeed correctly calculated. The meeting on the LB took place at Togau, in these professional conversations, one thing invariably caught my eye, the careful analysis of even the most minute details of the operation. As a result of cooperation with Soviet officers, it became clear to me for the first time how important it is to systematically analyse military events at all their stages down to the smallest details. In my opinion, it was thanks to this method that the Soviet military command during the Great Patriotic War calculated operations so accurately that it possessed the key. The parameter that made it possible to correctly delineate military successes, their causes and consequences, and to prepare new operations. Such a key formula served as the basis for directing military operations. Once, during an evening conversation, I learned that both Colonel Dubrovitsky's family and his relatives felt the consequences of the atrocities of the fascist system, and yet he showed a deeply thoughtful and sincere understanding of the fate of the Germans, those who had to see with their own eyes, as we did what the Nazi crimes consisted of and led to, were able to appreciate properly the ability of a Soviet man to see the difference between a German who had become a criminal and those Germans who had retained a spark of humanity in their souls. This ability was possessed by Colonel Dubrovitsky, as well as by Colonel Tulpanov, who paid truly remarkable attention to our work. I occasionally had to hear him speak or analyse problems with him, and in all these cases he made a deep impression on me. Major Ozeraner from Odessa was a temperamental, ardent man who was eager and able to captivate every interlocutor with his ideas and intentions. 
Kion Braginsky, a historian, as a true scientist, was accustomed to analyze and justify all decisions thoroughly, but at the same time, in the course of the discussion, he always intuitively grasped when and how to break the remnants of resistance to clear the way for understanding the tasks before us and stimulate our activity in the interests of the new Germany. At times I thought about the fact that I met officers who, in fact, study not the usual military problems, but the character, behavior of Germans, their way of thinking. These psychologists, educators in military uniforms, tried with great insight and sensitivity to understand our outlook and worldview, looked closely at us, hoping that they would be able to awaken such perceptions and character traits that would lead to a beneficial evolution in our mental and spiritual life. The attentive attitude shown to each of us by our individual Soviet comrades, the friendship that developed between us and the Soviet officers, the confidence that we would jointly defeat the common enemy, destroy him once and for all, and finally simply put the feeling of personal gratitude felt by everyone who had become a different person here in the Soviet Union. These are all prerequisites of the friendship binding us to the Soviet Union, which Otto Puskitok characterized. Under the influence of the French Revolution, the American bourgeois Democrat Jefferson once said that every good patriot has two fatherlands, his own and France. Now that the peace camp has grown up, led by the Soviet Union, we say, every true fighter for peace has two fatherlands, his own and the glorious, peace-loving Soviet Union. The collapse of the German army group, Three weeks after the opening of the Second Front in the West, on June 23, 1944, the three Belarusian fronts one after another began, together with the First Baltic Front, a general offensive against Army Group Center. Initially, the fortified strongholds, Bobrisk, Mojilev, Orsha, Vitebskek, were bypassed, the retention of which Hitler strongly demanded in the order no. 11. The Soviet shock armies broke through to the Berezina, surrounded the main forces of the two German armies, liberated Minsk, along a wide front, made their way further to the Neman. Five weeks later approached the Vistula and were on the outskirts of East Prussia. Army Group Center ceased to exist. 200,000 soldiers of this group fell in battle. 85,000 were taken prisoner, among them 21 generals. By Stalingrad was a turning point in this war, which decided the fate of Hitler, the current disaster that befell Army Group Center means that the gate opened, opening access to our homeland. The outcome of this merciless battle of enormous scale was marked by some new features. For the first time, German generals not only capitulated and ordered their troops to cease resistance, but they simultaneously openly opposed Hitler on July 22, 1944, two days after Stauffenberg's failed assassination attempt on Hitler in the Wolf's Den. Sixteen captured generals of Army Group Center, among them Generals Winzenz Muller, Felkers, von Lotzo, Bamler and Golwitzer, spoke out against Hitler, signing a proclamation in which they supported the slogan, The struggle against Hitler is a struggle for Germany. Of their number, eight men, Generals Felkers, Winzenz Muller, von Lotzo, Hofmeister, Golwitzer, Trout, Ingel, and Klamt declared at a meeting of the National Committee on August 3 that they were joining the German anti-Hitler coalition. In August, on the day General Feldmaschal von Witzleben was hanged on Hitler's orders, the commander of the German 6th Army spoke on Radio Free Germany. Deeply shocked by the collapse of Army Group Center and the atrocities of the SS in relation to the participants of the conspiracy on July 20, Paulus expressed all those thoughts that he had to originate still under the impression of our conversations with him, and directed to him personally our reports from the front, Germany has lost the war. In addition, the methods of treatment of the population in the occupied regions disgust every real soldier and every real German and cause worldwide anger. Unless the German people themselves renounce these crimes, they will have to bear full responsibility for them. Germany must renounce Adolf Hitler and establish a new state power, which will end the war and create conditions for our people to continue to live and establish peaceful, even friendly relations with our current adversaries. A few days later, Field Marshal Paulus publicly announced his joining the Union of German Officers. He had already announced this decision in mid-July in a conversation with Wilhelm Pieck and Martin Luttmann. Now he has joined us. What we had hoped for at the founding of the Union has been realized. Meanwhile, everyone who had not been hypnotized by the Go Bebel's legend of the miracle weapon clearly understood that the military disaster on all fronts had become a fait accompli. Army Group Southern Ukraine was annihilated, Army Group North was cut. 
In the same situation were after the surrender of Romania and Bulgaria German formations in Greece and Crete. Finland ceased hostilities. Anglo-American troops landed on the coast, moving forward. The Red Army approached the easternmost border of the Red Soon the gates leading to the theater of war on German territory were to be breached. In this situation, the National Committee again appealed to all Germans to join the popular front against fascism. During the following months, we repeated many times the slogan, all forces and all arms against Hitler, and gave clear instructions on how to fight. In leaflet of September 1944, I wrote I organize a mass refusal to carry out Hitler's orders. I urged, using your weapons in close cooperation with the civilian population, hasten Hitler's fall. Other slogans read, sabotage the war machine by all possible means, disarm the cess, destroy the Gestapo agents, fight back against Himmler's terror, unite with democratically minded men and women, with all opponents of Hitler, with oppressed workers of all professions, and again and again forward, in the name of peace and the salvation of the nation, forward, for freedom and true democracy, an end to war, all forces, all arms against Hitler. These were the appeals, the appeals, the detailed instructions right up to the last proclamation with which I addressed the people of Munich on April 26, 1945. It was not in our power to make Germany itself free from the power of fascisms, but we achieved that many Germans were ripe with the decision to renounce fascism and take a new path. Teenagers at the front. In between propaganda speeches, we made constant visits to power transfer camps. From about the end of September 1944, it became increasingly striking to see how rapidly the number of very young soldiers was growing. Guys in uniforms stood in front of us. They should have been small, stunted men, but they were teenagers, their cheeks lightly showing the first fluff. Now Hitler was sending 16, 17-year-old boys into battle. Among them were not only Germans, but also natives of various countries. They were attracted by promises, deceit recruited by blackmail and threats. It was heavy on my heart when I met them. I thought of my family. My older sons were also very young and were somewhere at the front. It's like these boys, they might have been fighting in the midst of an encirclement. They would probably have goggled if they had suddenly seen their father here in uniform with all the insignia. They would have been even more surprised when they heard him speak in new, unfamiliar ways. He would no longer tell them about his adventures in the war, nor would he share with them the impressions of his endless travels. He would not tell them how much there was to see and learn by traveling all over Europe how he had visited cities he wanted to see at least once in his life, knowing their role in history and in art. He would not talk about what he had seen and learned, would not talk about the fact that he had been able to visit his family in Cologne or Nuremberg. Yes, just as these teenage soldiers and my sons would have looked at me surprised and confused if I had appeared before them in a uniform with the white armband of the National Committee. Looking into the faces of these teenagers, I felt helpless. For the first time, I did not know how to make conversation. We sat like that on stacked telegraph poles, in the shade of fruit trees, behind a wooden shed that had accidentally survived the collective farm. A group of about sixty people were placed in the barn. The night before last they had been fished out in the woods with other soldiers who had broken away from their units, or pulled from the bombed-out trenches and cellars in which they had hid. As Soviet officers told us, we had to almost forcibly drag these guys out of their hiding places, who were shaking and crying with fear, expecting to be shot at once. When little by little the conversation started, I learned from one of the boys that he was hiding between the corpses of the soldiers from the machine gun crew. A Soviet soldier who noticed him put a rifle to his chest. The boy literally stared into our faces with dark flaming eyes, completing the story. And then he took the rifle away and tore my cap off my head, and I lost my helmet earlier. In deep silence we listened to his story. The boy was shorn almost naked and he could have been twelve years old. He was small in stature. The other had run away from his company with the captain and the radio team. Suddenly they were surrounded by Soviet soldiers. He was separated from the captain, and timidly asking if he would meet him again. He told us his last name. None of these teenagers understood why they were gathered here together, even though they belonged to different units. It did not occur to them that this was taken care of by those Soviet officers who, because of the war, had to stop their professional teaching activities. These young men were also incapable of realizing that the Soviet soldiers, officers and privates were shocked that they had to deal with such boys. They remembered their sons or the sons of their relatives and friends, 
and were horrified at the thought that they had to shoot children in battle. We found out where these boys came from, where their families lived, asked about their father's profession, about their brothers and sisters. There was one with whom we had to explain ourselves in French, with another in Italian. There were lanky boys among them, some weak, narrow-chested, and some stocky, but all of them gaunt, with sunken cheeks, ragged. They looked around confusedly, sometimes cheerful, if we managed to draw them into conversation. And the long-haired Frenchman, with a long strand of hair hanging over his forehead from under his beret, was a very emotional young man. He was from Vitrachassine, the Belgian from Louvain site. Had I known that we would have to fight here in Russia, we would have behaved smarter at home. One of these boys whispered strangely, as if deliberately mocking the Viennese, he was a native of Upper Austria. Listening to him, everyone laughed, even when they didn't know what he was talking about. The laughter helped to diffuse the tension. Another boy, a very young boy. He had already played some role in the Hitler Youth and was going to become a teacher. Told us that the captain of his unit yelled at the young men, threatened them with a revolver, raging because they were unable to carry out his orders with lightning speed. When one older soldier, also from the reserve battalion, tried to object and politely and calmly, the captain became quite angry. The soldier did not put up with it, and then the captain immediately shot him in front of his comrades as a rebel. Then, continued the narrator, he himself uncomplainingly allowed to load him with anti-tank grenades, although he could only with difficulty carry them. He trembled with fear as he lay in ambush with those grenades. In addition, he did not check the fuse, and this was supposed to do without fail. Now there were cases of sabotage when charging, charging. Fortunately, the Russian tanks didn't come close. We took a break in conversation, gave the young men cigarettes. They asked how to pronounce the letters of the Russian alphabet, wrote letters on cigarette boxes, and this also distracted them. None of them was limping badly. We suggested he take off his boots. It turned out that his feet were full of blisters and were festering. The other, apparently by mistake, had put on someone else's boots when the alarm was sounded during the night. His boots, he complained, were brand new, but these were too big for him. The Soviet comrades who were there were writing something down in their notebooks. They immediately separated him from the others in order to give him immediate help. We did not talk about the National Committee Free Germany with these guys. We only tried to write down more of their home addresses. Leaflets listing these names were soon dropped at the location of the German troops. We also promised to include the names of these boys in the programs on the trench transmitter and in the Moscow radio broadcasts. This caused surprise and joy. They became even more talkative. They asked if they could send letters home, if they would stay together in the same group and then, somewhat timidly but with obvious curiosity, if we were always on the front line and what we were doing here. This was the right moment to touch on events of the recent past, what they had been through. Now it was possible to draw their attention to our tasks. There was nothing more that could be done at that moment. There were already many young soldiers in our ranks, to whose care these young men in soldiers' uniform could be conscientiously handed over. Our front school was grateful for the opportunity of selecting from among the young men used for criminal purposes, the best for a useful cause. Is it possible to determine with precision for how many young men these meetings were decisive on the way to a new life? The extermination camp at Majadanik. There was never a day when we did not learn of some new facts, extremely disturbing and exciting. The Nazis' brutal orders and their crimes were horrifying. None of us could have imagined what misfortunes these atrocities promised our people. Although the front headquarters tried to make us Germans realize that no one had forgotten about the existence of another, better Germany, and although we ourselves had long ago disassociated ourselves from the fascist system, it was difficult for us to get rid of the burden of heavy thoughts and our hearts shrank at the thought of our suffering homeland, which, under the rule of an inhuman system and through its own fault, was inexorably sliding toward disaster. Our Soviet comrades understood what kind of mental drama we were experiencing, especially in those days when they celebrated new victories, though without noisy jubilation, but with a sense of high satisfaction and consciousness of the sacrifices at the cost of which these successes had been achieved. For them, every day meant the approaching end of the war and the possibility, at last, to return to peaceful labor. Meanwhile, the fate of our homeland was becoming more and more hopeless every day. As the Soviet troops approached Lublin, the ominous word Majadanik was heard, the name of the concentration camp in which, as we had already heard, 
the extermination of people had become a system. We went there to witness what this place of mass murder was like. During the hours we spent there, we grew grey hair. We had been mentally disturbed for many days, haunted by these impressions, and so had hundreds of people who, like us, had seen these mountains of corpses. For the first time I had the opportunity to look into the very jaws of the Moloch of fascism. All that I had to see, I described in an article published in the newspaper Fris Deutschland on October 15, 1944. The article, In our school days we were told that in ancient Rome, for the amusement of those in power, people were burned, and they burned like torches. In the future, in schools all over the world, children will be told that Hitler and his executioners spent years systematically exterminating millions of people. The victims were people of all ages, of all nationalities, without distinction of class, profession or religion. They were exterminated and destroyed only because they did not bow to Hitler's tyranny or because it did not need them. Listen to the word of truth. Let every German know. This is the true face of Hitler. We drove through liberated Lublin on a clear, sunny Sunday afternoon. The streets were filled with joyful people, their faces shining, and at every step we could see how happy they were, celebrating the... If we had not been met by soldiers, if we had not seen the bombed-out houses and the Jewish quarter turned into a desert and raised to the ground, it might have seemed that the war had not happened at all. But here is a signboard marking the way to the concentration camp, five kilometres from the city where numerous camp barracks are located on an area of several square kilometres, and where a 20-metre-high tower-like chimney for venting gases towers over everything. There the systematic extermination of people took place. In hundreds of packed barracks they languished, these victims brought from all countries, from all regions, who for years had groaned under the oppression of Himmler's terror. This camp was the last step on the thorny path of millions of victims from the European space. No matter how long a labelled person had been here, no matter whether he had been brought from Dachau or from the concentration camp Papenburg on the banks of the EMs or from Warsaw, he was doomed to death. The process took place as in a factory. Everyone was numbered, prepared to be sent to the slaughterhouse. They were not considered living people with soul and body, with a loving heart, whether mother or child, invalid or young man, brave Russian soldiers, worker or scientist, all of them were in the eyes of the executioners a faceless mass, doomed to perish according to Hitler's plans of mass extermination. What happened to these victims? In front of the barracks. Line up for washing. Undress. Put your clothes in paper sacks and hand them in. Write your names on the hangers. Forward march, there are still a lot of people who need to wash today. Skinny, emaciated people are washing in the bathhouse. Quickly, quickly forward. Make room for the next ones. To the drying room. There you will get your things back after disinfection. But the things are not returned, never will be. The bewildered victims enter the large concreted cells. Twenty, thirty people at once, naked, barefoot. The process moves quickly. Steel doors with rubber gaskets are slammed shut. The room is bright. A despicable creature stands outside by a gas-tight viewing window. A few turns of the hot air lever. There's a hiss. Gas seeps into the room. People stagger, groan, fall to the ground. Death spasms convulse the human bodies falling on top of each other. Numbers crossed off the list of the living. This is how thousands, tens of thousands died. In the name of the German people. Were there few Germans who said, Hitler is Germany? Do you have any doubts about the number of victims? Follow me to the longest barracks, where thousands of pieces of underwear and clothing were simply thrown away. Here are piles of the last pathetic belongings of men, women and children. Pants, jackets, blouses, shirts, bras, socks, prisoners' clothes with numbers, pullovers with yellow branding and oil paint, silk underwear, prisoners' jackets and children's dresses, in short, everything with which people of all classes and occupations cover their bodies. On the front side of the cardboard shackle of a paper sack, on which it was hung. A cross was placed if the sack had already been used. But on the back side, there was a free space for a new number. Why waste more paper than you need to do your business? Isn't this evidence enough for you? Follow me further, even if your knees are buckling, for you have a premonition that the evidence will be even scarier. But I must show you everything. A large barracks, 45 metres long, 10 metres wide. Already outside the building lie thousands of boots under the windows, 
Two-thirds of the barracks are filled with boots, tons of pairs of shoes of all sizes, colors, styles, among them even elegant shoes for the beach. Then prostheses, bandages, orthopedic shoes, and mm, baby boots, in which babies took their first steps. This terrible warehouse is a more amazing testimony than a file cabinet with the names of those killed and gassed in the asylum. There are as many shoes here as would suffice for the inhabitants of a large city. I ask myself again and again, is this all real? I hear the same questions all around me, but the facts are irrefutable. I hold in one hand a baby shoe suitable for a two-year-old girl, and in the other hand a Russian soldier's boot, and here's a nail-studded mountain boot from my Bavarian homeland. So no one was but where were the corpses of the victims left? In an open field near the camp, they were buried en masse, huddled together, in deep pits. However, this method of burial did not meet the requirements of the case. After all, it was necessary to prepare for mass production all year round. Therefore, a crematorium with a large capacity was built on the highest place. Five cremation ovens were built side by side in one block. Each oven could be loaded with four or five corpses at a time. The corpses were fed into the furnace along rails in an iron cart, which was tipped inside the furnace. The bone remains and ashes fell through the grates into the ash receptacles at the bottom. From there, the ashes could be discharged from both sides as needed with special shovels and fire hooks. All five installations are still filled to the top with the ashes of burned people. It literally spills through the cell doors. There are ashes everywhere underfoot, shards of bone. The tower-like quadrangular chimney has a turbine built into it to suck out the gases. Even in the air ducts I found half-burnt thigh bones and ribs. The ashes from the corpses were immediately taken to a nearby vegetable garden and mixed with piles of compost to better fertilize the ground. All this can be seen at the site. In case it was not known who was in charge of the place, the SS stamp can be found on all found documents and papers. Let's think about the fact that the Führer of these SS is now the supreme commander of the German Reserve Army. To think that this criminal now mercilessly disposes of our young sons, forcibly mobilized into the army, and has the opportunity to send them into the last desperate battle. In the hands of Himmler is concentrated unlimited power in our homeland. He is subordinate to the German police, and he is authorized to commit any acts of brutal violence. That says it all. It is we Germans who must fulfill our sacred duty to help expose the murderers of millions, not only to accuse the villains, but also to punish these men. In the name of Germany, I left this terrible, horrible place filled with anguished anxiety for the fate of our youth, poisoned by the poison of Nazism. Not far from the camp, about 200 meters away, there is a hospital where wounded German prisoners of war receive the best medical care and recover. They are not made to feel that they too should be responsible for what their compatriots have done here. Now do you understand why I bowed my head low and paid tribute to the magnanimity of our opponents? I bowed my head in grief and shame. Hey men and women of Germany, if we do not want the atrocities committed here in the extermination camp, near Lublin to bring shame to the name of our nation forever, we must embark on the only possible path. An open, merciless struggle against Hitler clear our minds of the pernicious poison. Merciless condemnation of Hitler and his handmaidens. For the sake of the German people, when six months later the war approached the walls of my hometown of Munich, I appealed to the population to stop the senseless resistance and, remembering the lessons of Majdanek as a pledge and a warning, I with all means helped to rescue the prisoners in the concentration camp of Dachau and to free the political prisoners from the prisons of Neudeck and Stadelheim, helped to liberate foreign workers and prisoners of war.